Hello, let's take a look at this 12 lead from Paramedicine 101, the Facebook page. Um, if you saw it, there's the case presented with it, so let's look at the case. It's a 70-year-old female. She's got chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, upon arrival, you see she's sitting upright, she's clenching her chest, and she's got labored respirations, and states that this has been getting worse all day, uh, but when she woke up is kind of when it started. She's allergic to penicillin and sulfa. Her meds are lisinopril. That's an ACE inhibitor now. ACE inhibitors always make me think CHF. It's kind of the perfect drug for congestive heart failure. If you think about the CHF uh, pathophysiology process, uh, it, a lot of it comes from, the congestion that is, comes from the compensatory mechanisms from the kidneys. So ACE inhibitors like lisinopril are perfect for that condition. Digoxin, uh, I kind of threw that in there because digoxin can, can be used for CHF and it's also one of the drugs that causes all kinds of uh, ST changes on 12 EDKGs. So I like to throw that in there and make people think digtox. Uh, furosemide, which is just Lasix, that's a diuretic, also making me think congestive heart failure. Uh, also Plavix, and when I see the combo of Plavix and Dig, I think uh, when I put them on the EKG they're going to be an AFib. Wasn't the case with this one, but you know. I just threw that in there as well. Omeprazole, that's just Prilosec. Uh, albuterol and Singulair make you think uh, bronchoconstriction or reactive airway disease, right? So you're thinking maybe COPD. You have a wide differential based on this information so far. You're thinking possibly cardiac. That's got to be on the top of your list. Could be an MI, right? I mean, chest pain um, or shortness of breath. Shortness of breath can be an angina equivalent. Uh, there's other things, you know, obviously that could, so you're going to want to look at the skin color, condition, temperature and the EKG eventually. Uh, you're thinking maybe CHF, okay, it could be a CHF exacerbation, we gotta listen to lung sounds. Could be COPD, put them on capnography, look for that shark fin waveform on the capnogram to help you with your differential. Remember, not all wheezing is, is COPD or asthma, that could also be CHF, so you gotta be real careful with this patient. Um, so we got a wide differential. The rest of the information kind of reveals, you know, uh, the dyspnea, doesn't let you get any hit, more history from her. That kind of confuses things. And this started after she woke up, which that also sits with me. You know, a lot of MIs patients are woken up from chest pain, and a lot of CHFers, uh, you know, wake up with shortness of breath because, you know, supination doesn't really help their case. So looking at the rest of this, uh, you, you don't get too much information. I mean, it, it's a good amount of pain. It started early in the morning. Um, and that's pretty much it. Now let's take a look at the 12 EDKG because that's what you're here for. So you got a 70 year old female, uh, ventricular rate 100, it uh, looks like a sinus rhythm. And you got a normal PR interval, so there's no AV block that we know of. Uh, and you can make the case that this might be ectopic atrial because AVL has a negative P wave and you should have upright P waves in every limb lead except for AVR. Uh, but that could just be an alteration of the axis from something else that we're going to mention here in a minute. The QR restoration is narrow, 96 milliseconds. Now on the Facebook site, I believe I said 114 milliseconds. I, I didn't look at the EKG and get the number. I just kind of threw one on there to give you something to look at. So uh, I apologize for that, but it's not going to make much of a difference with the interpretation. The QTC is short, 402 milliseconds. That's good. Uh, a normal QRS axis at 47 degrees. And if you want to just quickly look at it. If leads 1, 2, and 3 are all upright QRS complexes, uh, you're sitting pretty. So let's look at this 12 lead. Looking at it from afar, I always do that big bird's eye view at the 12 lead EKG and I get, uh, is there any abnormalities on it? And you certainly see that there are something, some things uh, standing out on this EKG. Uh, in fact, uh, if you looked at the comments on Facebook, a few people thought inferior wall MI, a few people thought you know, an anterior wall MI, and I can see why they thought those things. Uh, intuition, that is, uh, AVL looks like it would look with an inferior wall MI, uh, and then you see some ST elevation over here. I can tell you it's neither one of those things. There were a bunch of commenters on the site that picked up on left ventricular hypertrophy, specifically with left ventricular hypertrophy with a strain pattern, left ventricular strain pattern. Okay, and you can see it up here. Now, this information all up top here was not on the EKG on Facebook. 
But the GE Marquette uh, interpretive algorithm from Zoll lets us know that it thinks that there's left ventricular hypertrophy with great polarization abnormality. That's kind of the same thing as saying LVH with strain. So what is this? What is LVH? Uh, it's an enlargement of the heart muscle. It's a thickening of the heart muscle in the left ventricle. And it, what it does is it causes high voltage to show up on the EKG. Now, it's hard, difficult, if not impossible to say uh, for certain that somebody has LVH based on an EKG alone. You'd have to do more studies like an echo and all that. But we can get an idea because there are indicators on a 12 EKG that they probably do have some sort of cardiomegaly like LVH. And let's look at what those are. Now, first thing, you see high voltage. Now, in the textbooks, we learn that if you take the, the deepest S wave in V1 or V2, the millimeters, that is, each small box is one millimeter. So if you added up all these millimeters, okay, and then added that to the tallest R wave in V5 or V6, if your number is greater than 35 millimeters, you've got LVH. Well, there's a few problems with that. For one, there's other criteria for LVH. For instance, there's limb leads criteria. You could have a tall AVL. I think it's greater than 11 millimeters would be indicator of LVH. Uh, very tall lead one. Things like that. Also, pre-hospital monitors tend to cut very big QRS complexes short because we're printing on smaller paper, right? The paper's more narrow. So it needs to get all these complexes to fit, and it doesn't want to jumble up the, the, uh, the rhythm to make it too difficult to see. So if you look at V1, the bottom of the S wave in V1 was cut flat. That doesn't happen with normal conduction, that flat, that flat tip there. The same thing in the top of the QRS complex in V6. That is not normal conduction. The monitor is doing that. It's cutting that short, keeping it from interfering with its neighboring leads. It's helpful, but also kind of inhibits us from using that 35 millimeter criteria because we don't know the true uh, amplitude of these QRS complexes. So you can just assume that because it's doing that, these are very big QRS complexes. They're probably pretty big. And then we have other indicators, for instance, the P waves. If you look at these P waves in V1, you might be used to seeing a biphasic P wave in V1. But this P wave in particular, because it's so negative and deep and wide, that is an indication of left atrial enlargement. Uh, if you, you think you can fit a whole millimeter box in that negative aspect of that P wave, that's left atrial enlargement. And that kind of goes hand in hand with, with left ventricular hypertrophy. You know, you think full cardiomegaly with these heart failure patients, and that kind of fits, right? Um, and there's another indicator, and this is the, actually the most important thing, is the left ventricular strain pattern. And it doesn't matter if you identify LVH if you don't know what left ventricular strain pattern is. And many people are never taught it when they're, when they're uh, first educated on 12 leads. So let's take a look. Left ventricular strain pattern is this pattern you see in the precordial leads here. You have concave, upright, ST elevation, in the right precordials, mostly in V1 and V2 on this one, but you could have it all the way down to V3. And then concave down, ST depression, down sloping ST depression, in the left precordials. You have what's called T-wave discordance. Now, quite a few people thought this was a left bundle branch block uh, based on the pattern that they see. And that's not even that important, to tell you the truth. If you, you thought it was a left bundle branch block, it's because you're seeing the same pattern with a left bundle branch block. It's called a left ventricular strain pattern. And it's caused by T-wave discordance. Uh, that might sound confusing, so I'll quickly explain T-wave discordance. If you look at V1, T-wave discordance is the terminal wave is negative, the T-wave is positive. So whenever you see the T-wave deflected in the opposite deflection is the last wave of the QRS complex. We call that the terminal wave. In this case, they're S-waves and the T waves are upright, that is T wave discordance, and that causes ST elevation. It's the big reason that V2 will normally have ST elevation on quite a few people. So you, you look for more millimeters, so to speak, in V2. So V1 and V2 look a little bit elevated, ST elevation, it's concave up. The left precordials have a little bit of downsloping ST depression, high voltage, okay? Um, no changing, there's no dynamic changing, there's no reciprocal changes. Remember, these leads over here are not reciprocal to these leads over here, all right? 
there's no real reciprocal changes. This is just that strain pattern, left ventricular strain pattern. And the only way to get good at identifying this is to look at a bunch of them. So I implore you to go on to ems12lead.com, Google, and just type in left ventricular strain pattern uh, and, and look at as much of these as possible because that th these are a big mimic because they have so many ST changes on them. Um, and, they, and they do have the same effect as a left bundle branch block, uh, in essence, causing ST elevation in these left precordial leads. I mean, I'm sorry, in these right precordial leads. So what type of patient has this? Um, when you first taught 12 leads, you might have learned that young athletic males have LVH. Doesn't that sound a little silly to think, think of it that way? Because you're going to compare a, a finding that means an enlarged heart muscle in a young athletic male. No, you're, they're not working out their heart muscle, although they are working out their heart muscle. They're not uh, growing their heart muscle. They just have high voltage. That's normal in a, in a young person. So young athletic males do have high voltage, but it's not LVH. Uh, CHFers, CHFers are the ones you're going to see this EKG pattern on the most. Congestive heart failure patients get cardiomegaly. They get enlarged hearts, um, and this is very common for them. So it's not a STEMI. It's an SDE mimic, one of the hard ones. It's high voltage. You got ST elevation in the right precordial leads, ST depression down sloping, ST depression in the left precordial leads. It's, uh, it's narrow complex, so it's not a bundle branch block, but it's very similar to a left bundle branch block. I hope you enjoyed this case. Um, go on and learn as many of these STE mimics as you can. Definitely uh, go on to uh, Tom Boothelay's EMS 12 lead blog and check out what he's got because I'll tell you, he definitely covers this left ventricular strain pattern over and over again. And uh, there's just a whole bunch of other good stuff to learn on there too. All right, so stay in touch for the next one. Hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, Take care now.